Hey man, good evening, good evening, welcome to another Tuesday night's edition of Bible Study Word Study. Thank God for each and every one of you. We're going to get started with our hymn, inspirational hymn, and we'll launch into the lesson in a few. God bless. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we bless you once again. We're so grateful that you've accompanied us, Lord, from the rising of this morning sun to the going down of the same in the evening. We bless you, Lord, for the privilege of life. We bless you, Lord, for this day that you made, this day that you purpose us to be in. And I thank you, Lord, for our joy, our peace, Lord, our comfort, our provision, our pardon, Lord. More than anything, anything, Lord, we bless you for your presence. For out of your presence comes forth all such things. We're grateful to be able to assemble here this afternoon. I bless you, Lord, for those who have tasted and who have seen and who now declare 
that you are good. Your word, Lord, is tasty. Your word, Lord, is helping us to become better representation of you. And I thank you, Lord, for the hunger and thirst. And I thank you, Lord, for preparing a table for all of us. I bless each and every one that's gathered here tonight and that has gathered with us, Lord, until this very hour. And we thank you for their desire to know you in a personal way, to know you in a holy way, to know you in a loving and kind way, and to know what it is that you expect us, expect of each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to preach and teach. Lord, of being able to share what you place on this wretched heart. Move me out of the way, Lord. Speak, speak, that your people may hear truth, and that your people may comprehend, that your people who have ears to hear what thus said the Lord are attentive, are attentive and well fed. In Jesus' name I bless you. In Jesus' name I thank you. Amen. Amen. We want to be better. We want to be worthy. Mother Chambers, good afternoon or good evening. We want to be better day in and day out. The longer we live, the more we should grow. Not in terms of our physical stature. There comes a time when the physical man stops growing. And there's never an ending to the growth and the maturing of those who hunger and thirst and who are fed. Those who are strengthened. And those who invest time and feasting on the word of our Father who art in heaven. We need what we're doing. We have to have what we're doing. Good morning, I mean, good afternoon, good evening, Sister Loda. And so when we invest time in doing what we're doing, I, I pray, I pray, I pray that you're being encouraged, that you're being uh, inspired, that you're being helped, and that you are growing more and more as we spend time in sessions like this. I uh, always invite your participation. I invite your input. Throw something on the timeline. If you have questions, if you have comments, and I will share them with all who can't see it. Amen. Lesson number 32 tonight. Still in chapter 11. We're going to finish it up. Looking at verse 9 through, or 19 through 30. Um, we discussed last week how it was that uh, the disciples uh, were able to, to still be yet effective, even though they faced challenge. And take note that there's the, the upside of being faithful to God, being that faithful witness, and there's the downside of being attacked for being faithful in your witness. This work we're doing is too important. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. God says the fields are ripe. They're white and the crop is ready to be harvested. The time of the harvest is right now. Harvesting is right now. And so we have to be industrious and we have to do all that we can do to bring in that field, that seed or that fruit that God has allowed to grow is harvesting season. And he's looking for some laborers, that's you and I. And we need to be well equipped. That's what the word of God is doing for us. Tonight, uh, we're looking at getting back to uh, our father's business, getting back to being ministry minded. And being ministry minded is being able to focus on the task at hand, even in the midst of those things which are causing us or which try to cause us to lose our focus. Above all, we need to keep our eyes on Christ. Keep looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the reason that we strive to be holy, the reason that we strive to be better, the reason that we strive to be about our Father's business in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to him because the times indicate that time is not long and any day now the good Lord is going to send our Lord and Savior back 
to reap us, to rapture us out of this existence. Deacon Thomas Lowe, good evening. Mother Elonia Evans, good evening. Sister Bradley Turner, good evening to you as well. Okay, what are we looking at? Remember, our objective is to be mission-minded, mission-focused in terms of ministry. Our desire is to defeat the killer seeds in the church. The killer seeds are a hindrance to ministry. The killer seeds will cause ministry to become stagnant. The killer seeds will make us ineffective as witnesses and ministers of the grace of our Father who art in heaven. What are the killer seeds? Compromise. Compromise is where we get into a place where we become double-minded. And the scripture says, double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Being double-minded is trying to keep a foot in the world and trying to keep a foot in the Christian ministry. It does not work like that. And the world will see and can tell that we're double-minded. And being double-minded, we are not committed to either one. And so, Ours have, to, ours have to be a compelling testimony. People have to see that we are sold out in this business of being about our father's business. So the killer sea of compromise, we got to do away with. The killer sea of complacency, that's, that's getting to the place where you think you have arrived. You're satisfied, and in essence, you're not growing. You're not maturing. Still bathe. That's what Paul talked about when he talked about the church. He says, you should be eating meat, but I still got to feed you milk because you're babes in mind, babes in dis disposition. You're unable to handle, handle the weightier things of the gospel. Being contentious, that's just a bunch of infighting. God is trying to move us from a place where we're being where we're infighting. Paul, he says, uh, the scriptures tell us that, you know, why is, ask the question, why is there so much envy and, and strife amongst us? We, the body of Christ. And he says it's because we lust and we want to have our own way instead of letting God have his way. That's a total surrender. God talks talk to us about that in our uh, morning inspirational message. Total surrender giving yourself over to God. When we give ourselves over to God, that means we've gotten to the place where we are going to just allow God to use us in whatever fashion. We're not going to fight it. We're not going to moan and groan about it. We're going to do those things that God expects us to do. And sometimes those things put us in a position where it seems like we're weak, incapable, turning the other cheek. That's humbling yourself. And God wants us to humble ourselves before him. Okay, so we talked about being contentious, getting rid of the killer sea of confusion. Now, the biblical definition of confusion is shameful. And, and, and if we look at the things that are happening out of the church, we look at the way the church is handling this this plague season that we're in, instead of being in a position to inspire and encourage, the church is fumbling. And so if the church fumbles, we're not going to instill confidence in anybody else. That's why we study, to show ourselves approved of God, workmen who need not be ashamed, who need not be confused or confusing. It's confusing for me to say something like, I know the Lord will make a way when I'm moaning and groaning about everything that's negative in my life. It's confusing to the world when, when I'm moaning and groaning about how people are treating me when I say that the Lord will make it right after a while. It's confusing to the church when I say I trust God for everything when I'm complaining indeed about everything. We either trust him or we don't. And there cannot be any confusion on our part because if there's confusion on the part of the church, there's going to be confusion on the part of those who are looking 
for a way out of their own shame and their own loss situation and circumstances. So confusion, we're looking to, to destroy the killer sea called contradiction. And, and a scripture I want to refer us to is Mark 7 and 13. Contradiction from the scripture says, as a Christian, you nullify the word of God and make it of none effect. That's kind of leaning back into the confusing part, the shameful part. Traditions that we hold dear in the church which have nothing to do with magnifying and giving God glory. We've got to know this word. And as we know this word, we know whenever we begin to drift and go astray and begin to become more focused on ourselves and these time honored traditions that are being upheld in the church. And when we get back to our father's business, we know that really it's all about putting our hands to the plow, not looking back and looking forward to pouring ourselves out like drink offerings that God may get every bit of us for his glory to magnify his great name and that we may represent before a world that's hungry, a world that's hurting, and a world that needs to hear people giving God glory, giving God credit, magnify him, blowing him up, making him larger than our circumstances. He's larger than COVID. He's not larger than financial difficulties. He's larger than our sickness. He's larger than our alliance, our allegiance to our friends and our family. God is so huge in our lives. That's what this word is designed to help us to do. As we look at the text tonight, starting at verse 19, we're continuing uh, to talk about how it is that you and I have to be focused on ministry, even during times of adversity. We are in a time of adversity. We are going through a lot. But the world should see us rejoicing. The world should see us content in the status that we are in. And so when we avail ourselves to God, to God, and we rely on him in and at all times, we find ourselves being the representation that God desires us to be in these troubling days. First thing, point of emphasis number one, as we look at this text tonight, starting in verse 19, we see the disciples fulfilling the great commission of Christ. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 tells us this. Jesus, after his resurrection, he says, all power has been given unto me. And he tells his disciples, go ye, therefore, because I have all power, and that power is going to be extended through you to the world. Go ye therefore into all the world. Go everywhere I send you. Preach to everybody the gospel of Jesus Christ. Teach everybody the way, the truth, and the life. Tell everybody about me. Go into the byways and the highways. Go into the low places. Go into the high places. Talk about him on your job. Talk about him in your home. Talk about him in the street. Fulfilling the great commission. Oh, we need it now. We need to be loud. We need to be vociferous. We need to be proclaiming the truth, the way, and the life that is Jesus Christ. So in Matthew, we see, tells us, shows us that Jesus, Matthew 28 shows us that Jesus has given that commission to his disciples. He follows that up as we look into uh, him declaring, uh, telling us that we need to go declare and preach and teach in Acts chapter 1. We start chapter 1 of Acts, verse 8. He's saying the same thing. He said, you are my witnesses. 
and I need you to go everywhere and tell everybody. We, we need to be out there. We need to be preaching. We need to be teaching, not just with our mouths, but with our lifestyles. Folks need to see us looking like what it is we're talking about. They need to see us going as Jesus has commanded us to go. They need to see us sowing, putting the seeds of life, putting the seeds that are going to help uh, implanting those seeds, imparting those seeds in the lives of those people in all of the arenas of this world. Being indiscriminate sowers. Remember we talked about in the last couple of lessons, you know, God is not a respecter of person. And he, he, he wants us, as he did with Peter, he wants us to be impartial. He wants us to be non-discriminator. The parable of the sower, he threw seed everywhere. Seed landed in rocky places. Seed landed in shallow places. Seed landed on the path. And seed landed on fertile ground. He threw it everywhere. And we are to sow the seed. Take this word called Jesus Christ and plant it, sow it in the hearts and, man, and minds of men, women, boys and girls, everywhere we are. And so we got to fulfill the great commission. Verse 19 says this. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but only the Jews only. None but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus, Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Preaching the Lord Jesus. That's all we need to do. Walk Jesus, talk Jesus, sleep Jesus, eat Jesus, tell somebody about Jesus. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, our conversation should be all about Jesus. We waste time in this world getting entangled in conversation that have nothing to do with bringing glory to God. Nothing to do with, with telling people about the love of God and the love that he demonstrated by sending Jesus Christ, who has now risen with all power into the world for our sake. And we waste time. We waste precious time. We waste precious energy when we're talking about anything other than Jesus Christ. And we need to make sure that he is the first and foremost at the forefront of our minds as we witness in these last and evil days. We need to be going, as Jesus declared. We need to be sowing the seed of Christ. And we need to be showing people how to live for Jesus Christ. Because we have learned, and we still are learning, how to serve him. I, I've been in this race for a while, but I'm still learning how to better serve Jesus Christ. Serve him from the totality of my being, all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength. That is an event, that is um, an investment in ministry, ministry minded. That is an, an investment and that shows forth that we are focusing on what really matters in this life. Point of discussion number two. We need to be as disciples preaching and teaching to the lost and reaching the lost in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said, you know, I preached Christ and him crucified. Every message, the focus ought to be on letting people know that Jesus died for us all. That he suffered for us, that he surrendered and gave his only life, gave his very life. So that you and I would not have to suffer the consequences of the lives that we've lived. Of, of the sins that we have committed. Through his death. 
and, and too many people out there are, are struggling because they don't think they are worthy. Well, you know what? None of us are worthy. None of us should get off. The wages of sin is death. We should suffer eternal damnation and torment for our sins. But God so loved us that he sent Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb. And so our emphasis is that when we reach, when we preach and teach Jesus Christ and him crucified, we've got to let people know, you do not get to the place where you are forgiven for your sin based on the good works that you do, based on how righteous it is that you try to live. We get to that place only by confessing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that's what we need to be telling the folks in the world. You can't get yourself together. God has to get us together and get us to the place to where we are fit for heaven. And we do that in the person, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Last point of emphasis for tonight. We see that the disciples, because they're preaching and they're teaching, we see that the disciples reaching the lost. We look at verse 21 through 26. I'll, I'll summarize that right quick. 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Hey, look, you put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ. Be glad that he has accepted you. Be glad that he has made you worthy. Be glad that he has justified. And being justified means we don't get to see God face to face based on our own righteousness, which the word says like a filthy rag. We get to have audience with God. We get to talk to God. We get to have the favor of God because Jesus Christ justified us and made us right. He's our advocate. He is the one who ushers us into the presence of God. It says in this scripture that it was at Antioch, this place where they are, that they first became known to be Christians. This was initially meant to be a derogatory term, but for us it's a term of endearment because it says that we are followers of Christ. I mentioned in the message, I think it was Sunday, I, I mentioned that, you know, Jesus said this. He says, when you see me, you see the Father. When the world sees you, when the world sees me, when the world sees us, they ought to see the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ, of God, being reflected through us. We ought to be that Bible that they don't read. We ought to be that word that they're searching for so that when God providentially puts us in somebody's path, they see that we are sincere about who we are in Christ Jesus. New creatures, born again. So lastly, point of emphasis number three, and we'll close. We see the disciples were actively operating in the Holy Spirit. This started early in the chapter when they were all gathered together in one place on one accord. God saw them at peace with one another. God saw them in the place with one another. God sent his anointing upon each and every one of them. We can't be effective witnesses if we are not operating in the Holy Spirit. When you are operating in the Holy Spirit, you are utilizing the power of God and you are utilizing the gifts that God gave you. And that's what the last portion of this chapter talks about. 27, in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dirt. Here he was 
prophesizing, preparing God's people for what it is to come. You and I have gifts and you and I should be utilizing those gifts. We can't be sitting on them. We, the, the time is too far gone. The time is too close for the coming of our Lord and Savior. We need to be heralding. We need to be crying out. We need to be shouting. We need to be singing. Whether they want to hear it or not, we need to be making a joyful noise. The kingdom is coming. And we need to get ready for it. And so we need to be operating in our gifts. Whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is, whatever the ability, whatever the ability that the Holy Ghost has endowed you with, you need to be operating in it and letting people see how God is using you to bring him glory. And we see them exercising their gifts, operating in the spirit. When we operate in the spirit, it makes a difference. People will be drawn to Christ by the way we lift him up. And we have to elevate him above the world, elevate him above our struggles, elevate him above our troubles, elevate him above our sicknesses, elevate him, magnify the Lord, enlarge him, make him bigger than anything that would come into our lives to stress us, depress us, and to cause us to come short. You have something that God has given you. Use it. Partner with the body of Christ. Let us come together and be fitly framed. When we're fitly framed, we're not struggling and pulling against one another. The killer seed will be washed out of the church. There will no longer be compromise. There will no longer be complacency. There will no longer be contention. There will no longer be confusion. There will no longer be contradiction. We will be a people who have gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you for listening and tuning in tonight. I pray that you bless. Use what God has given you this day and every day that God gives you. Let's not take our time for granted. Let's move away from the killer seas and let us come together as that holy, loving, God-gathered, God-anointed, God-appointed, God-ordained assembly. God bless you. God loves you. And this poor wretch of a man loves you too. Have a great night.